Okay, today we're going to talk about concept maps and we're really going to go over how you can evaluate concept maps. So what I've found is that teachers love using concept maps in classrooms. It really captures schema, but then they have a whole stack of concept maps in their students and they're not really sure what to do with them after that. So today we're going to go over some ways that you can kind of systematically evaluate and look at those concept maps and um, we'll attach a rubric to them. So if you want, you can print out the PDF of the rubric that goes along with concept maps that's in the Canvas site. In addition, you should pull out the concept map that you made in our last lectures over a concept from your theory or from your class. And I'm gonna be doing this along with you with the concept map that I made today. So let's go to our next slide. So this is what the, um, rubric looks like. You can see that we're going to look at groupings, concepts, hierarchy, crosslinks, and propositions. And we'll go through each one of these areas separately. I do want to make a note here that you don't have to use this full rubric in order to evaluate the concept maps for your lab this week, but this gives you a starting point. This gives you some systematic ways to look at concept maps um, for evaluation, some ways that you can really systemize your thinking about looking at the complexity in which your students have organized their thoughts about their conceptualizations of the themes and the concepts that you ask them to write about in their concepts. So the first one is concepts. So let's see, in this one, you're just gonna score one point for each concept. So basically everything that they wrote down, everything that's in a bubble is gonna get one point. This is the easiest one to score. So in my, so in this example here, this is a uh, concept map of George Bush. You can see um, I put a red circle around each one of those concepts and there are nine of them. So really straightforward, there are nine concepts on this map. Um, here's a concept map that I made about comic book superheroes. So if you wanted to see how many concepts on the map, you could pause this and count. Or on the concept map that you made, you can count how many concepts you had. So I'll let you pause to count. I counted 28 on this map. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? This one's really straightforward. So the most simple thing that you can do is just count how many ideas, how fluent were the students, how many ideas could they write down. But this also is a little bit limiting because it doesn't tell us how they organized it, right? If we go back to this picture of George Bush, all they did was just have you know a series of ideas all coming out from the center and it doesn't really tell me how they've organized what they understood about George W. Bush. You can see in this example with the comic book heroes, there's a lot more complexity to how they've organized the thoughts. There's 28 ideas, but it doesn't that 28 doesn't tell me um, how I understood those 28 ideas, just that there were 28 ideas total. So we'd probably like to conceptualize this in other ways as well. So that leads us to groupings. And there's really three ways that we can think about how you can group things in a concept map. And the first example are point groupings, and that's where the concepts come from one single point. So in our example, a point grouping looks like this. It looks like um, where we have Iron Man and we have um, all coming out from a central point. If we think back to the George W. Bush example, everything's radiating from one central point. That's just, this is the most simple way that we could have a, have a grouping. The next one is open groupings, and this is where things are linked in a chain. So if we can see with this Peter Parker example, or Spider-Man example, they're in a chain. It goes from Spider-Man to Peter Parker to the Daily Bugle. It's in a chain. We need to have three or more of these. If you think back to the last lecture, when we had the example of the kayak trip, that was the example of an open grouping. Things were in a long chain of events. And finally, the most complex way that we could have um, a grouping is a closed grouping, and that's where things form a closed system or a, or a loop. So if we look at the Superman example, that's a closed grouping. We have Superman to Clark Kent to the Daily Planet, we also, um, which goes back to Lois Lane, who goes back to Superman. So it's a closed grouping, it's a loop. 
So look on your example. And again, if I was going to assign points to this, I would get one point for every point grouping, two points for every open grouping, and three points for every closed grouping. You don't have to assign points to the groupings in your concept maps for your lab, but it is a helpful way to think about the complexity and the ways in which your students or your participants have organized their ideas or their thoughts around your concepts. So you can take a little bit of time to think about the types of groupings that you see either in my example um, or in the example that you made. So I'll give you a chance to pause the recording to count. So in this example, I have one open grouping. So here are all of my open groupings or eight, I mean, sorry, point groupings. There are eight point groupings. Do you see those? Now let's think about my open groupings, the chains. I have one open grouping in my map. And then for closed groupings, the ones that formed a loop, I have the Marvel loop, the Superman loop, and the DC loop, three loops. Next, we'll talk about hierarchy. In hierarchy, this refers to the number of levels in your group. So how many levels does it come from the inside to the top? And we don't usually count that first um, concept as a level since you provided that to the students. So in this example of weather, you can see I have weather, I have precipitation moving air, I have wind, and then I have wind speed. So I have four levels of hierarchy here. Think about for the comic book um, <laughs> concept map, or for any of the maps that you made, think, try to count how many levels you see. And there are varying levels here, but try to find the most levels. Try to find the chain that has the most to count for your hierarchy. So in this example, I have Marvel. Oh, so I have, I have the level of the franchise then the level of the superhero, then the level of their um, secret identity, then the level of um, where they work. So there's four levels to my hierarchy, four. So there's four levels of hierarchy to this concept map. The more levels of hierarchy, the more complex my concept map is. Then you can think about how many hierarchies there are. Then we have crosslinks, and the crosslinks can be sometimes confused with those closed groupings. Then really what you're thinking about with crosslinks is how did I connect two ideas that don't really go, that aren't in part of the same group to each other? So this really shows the ways in which students are able to connect ideas um, together. So I, so if it's a part of a closed group, then that doesn't count as a crosslink. I'm looking for crosslinks across separate ideas. Um, so. You can see in this example of dogs, there's a cross link between greyhounds and poodles, right? And then that's really two different ideas where I've cross linked them together. And you can kind of get extra points. Um, so it's worth 10 points as opposed to the closed grouping, which was worth three. And it's really your discretion about what would be a closed group versus what's a cross link. Um, and I wouldn't get too bogged down into these ideas and the point values. Really, you're just trying to think and trying to capture for in the, in the concept maps um, your students thinking and trying to systemize your evaluation of that thinking. So um, in this example, um, I marked, um, think about where you see crosslinks in this, in this um, concept map or in the concept map that you created. So I have a crosslink between the Avengers and Spider-Man, um, between the Daily Bugle and the Daily Planet. So there's two crosslinks, right? Because Spider-Man's not always a member of the Avengers, but sometimes he is. And between the Daily Bugle and the Daily Planet, that's really a link between Spider-Man and Superman since they both work in newspapers. So think about how many crosslinks are on your maps. And then finally, propositions. And propositions are when you write um, words that connect um, the, the concepts on your map together. And again, some students won't do this and some students will. And it's good if you can kind of direct your students to 
describe how two concepts are related. Sometimes students just draw a line between two words and you, even as a teacher, you're like, I don't know why those two relate to each other. So it's helpful as a teacher evaluating concept map if the students write them down. And in this idea with this rubric, you can divide them between advanced and simple. So simple would just be, oh yeah, of course, and advanced would be using more advanced language or something that it shows um, technical thinking. And of course, this is pretty subjective and would really depend on the development of your students. So um, what would be advanced for a kindergartner might not be advanced for a you know, senior in high school. So you're gonna use your own judgment here. Um, so you can kind of see, um, and you and also as scoring you get a full point for the first time and a half a point for the second time if you're going to use point values otherwise you can just count them um there we go so you can see in this example how i scored it um in this example you can count how many propositions i have so i use secret idea secret identity a lot um arch enemy i use several times member of um, sometimes member of, and I counted that one as advanced. Um, I counted these as advanced because you really had to understand superheroes. Um, works for girlfriend is simple, both newspaper is simple. Again, so you can kind of see how I calculated this for this example. You can do the same thing for your examples. And again, I just want to remind you that you don't have to use this formal rubric for your schema lab. You can describe the outcomes of your concept maps in more general terms, where you talk about the complexity um, in a more qualitative way rather than a quantitative way. I'm a quantitative researcher, so I like to attach numbers to everything. But if you want to just describe how the concept maps were in a thematic way or talk about the complexity, you might want to use the terms hierarchy and cross links and um, open and closed groupings, but you don't have to fill out this entire rubric and count everything if you don't want to. It's completely up to you. Um, so again, thinking about what types of concepts you could use for your concept map in your content areas, you really want to be thinking about those big ideas. So thinking broadly, thinking about um, at the beginning of a unit, how you could use this for formative assessment to know what your students already know about the content that you're going to be teaching. Um, so this looks like um, a great idea, thinking about your schema lab as we move forward and how to assess concept maps. I look forward to seeing what you do in your labs this week. Bye.